everybody. This is Mary with Insect Shield back with our vlog and sharing some great information. And we've got a wonderful guest, Dr. Erica McTinger. She is an assistant professor of entomology at Penn State University. Welcome, Erica. Hi. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, first, if you could give us your, your background, your bio, how you got into what you're doing, and kind of also explain what it is that you do do now. Yeah, um, sure. So I grew up in Maine, on the coast of Maine. Um, and I, uh, so very much kind of in the woods. Um, and I also grew up uh, as an, an equestrian. So I was involved in horses since I was like four years old. And that took me all up and down the East Coast. And um, when I got to high school, I took a class in, in wildlife and thought that's exactly what I want to do. And so my requirement for my undergrad was it had to be within a half an hour of my trainer in Pennsylvania, yeah. <laughs> which happened to be the University of Delaware. So that's where I, I ended up. And um, the University of Delaware's wildlife program is heavily influenced by entomology. They're, they're the same program, basically. And so I um, was kind of thrown into this field of entomology. I didn't really even know it existed at the time. Uh, I fell in love with it. And I... Uh, so spent some time as a wildlife biologist after graduating and then went and got my graduate degrees in entomology. Um, and so what I do now is called veterinary entomology. So I um, deal with arthropod issues affecting non-human verte vertebrates, really. So um, things that, you know, harm deer or pests of horses or um, cattle or whatever the, whatever the animal is. Uh, and so I work with all sorts of different critters, wild to livestock. And now our Exactly arthropod. What defines an arthropod? Yeah, so arthropod is basically, uh, it breaks down to jointed leg, basically. So okay. it is um, a group of animals that uh, are related by these segmented legs. And so that can be anything uh, kind of crab, lobster, to tick, to fly, and, and lice, and all those other uh, insects. So it's different from... Um, so insects are arthropods, but not all arthropods are insects. Okay. Uh, so we say arthropods if we want to have a, a bigger group of animals that we're talking about. So arthropod pests of horses includes things like flies uh, and ticks, or arthropod pests of people includes mosquitoes, which are insects, and ticks, which are not. Um, so we use it as a kind of a bigger term. Gotcha. And so... With, well, so, I mean, you, with your equestrian background, you were probably also though, dealing with a lot of insects because, I mean, insects, I understand, with horses and in horse farms and barns, they're constantly having to be monitored and protected. Yeah, yeah. So, I guess it gives me a little bit of street cred for the horse people that, <laughs> um, that I, I've spent some time in their shoes. I had my own farm for a while and had to deal with some of these these issues and uh, a lot of these farm pests are kind of ubiquitous across all livestock and horses and poultry. Um, and we just kind of deal with them. And I kind of remember that side of me just going, okay, well, I'll get my fly spray and I'll do my things. And now knowing more about that now, I am better able to address those problems with my own horse. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that everybody who has a horse that's at a farm has to deal with. Now, are th and are they in are the arthropods or insects for horses are they hurting them or are they annoying them or both it it depends so so big picture both um but it depends on the insect or arthropod on on what they're doing um so so most pests that horse people are familiar with are flies um and most of the flies that we see are are more of a nuisance than they are pathogen um, vectors, if you will. So, right. um, you know, they're, they're creating horse, they're stomping, horses are running, um, they're uncomfortable, uh, or they're around people's faces, you know, um, and so that's what we see mostly. There are some flies like horse and deer flies that most people are familiar with too, that will come in and, uh, slash and slash and drink. Basically they slice open the skin and drink. So it's painful. Um, and then there are some flies like mosquitoes that can actually transmit pathogens um, like Tripoli and some of these other um, encephalitis that we don't really think about because we don't see them that often on our horses, but they they are there. So it, it, it's really a range of, um, 
of problems depending on what you're what pest you're talking about. Right. I mean, and ticks can like can horses get like Lyme disease? Yeah, horses okay. are are one of the animals that are actually susceptible. So people, dogs and horses um are all susceptible to Lyme disease. Um, or the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. And they can also get um, anaplasmosis, um, which people and dogs can get as yeah. well. So they are susceptible to, to many of the same pathogens that um, that we can get from tick bites. So what it, I didn't know, I was just thinking that. So it, it, it's only horses, dogs, and people that can yeah. get these. There's no other, like cats? Cats don't seem to be yeah. susceptible. Um, cattle don't seem, right. there's still some question about what, signs you see in something like a cow that has the pathogen, but they don't seem to have the same level of susceptibility. It's certainly not something that we we really talk about a lot with our um with our cattle folks because right. they don't it doesn't impact them like it does right. dogs and people and horses. Right. But then and then there's the animals that are the carriers, which primarily are mice, deer. Well, yeah. So so that for Borrelia, which is the pathogen that causes Lyme disease or anaplasma, um, mice and other small rodents and birds tend to be with what we call reservoir hosts. So that's where the pathogen kind of hangs out and a tick will bite them. And then a tick could bite in its next life stage, a horse or a dog or human and transmit that, which may cause disease. Deer actually don't carry the pathogen. They're what we call a reproductive host. So the adult tick will feed off a deer which allows it to reproduce, but the deer don't have any pathogens. So um, they're gotcha. important in the cycle, but they're not um, they're not associated with the pathogens. Okay, interesting. So then, so I think one thing that's interesting that you do a lot of work on is really, as opposed to just protecting like people from getting tick bites, you're like how do you protect the environment from having less ticks? Yeah, so that's a big question. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, because of landscape, landscape level control of ticks. Because um, like with the mosquitoes, they're mosquito control districts. They can go out and they can treat the water where the immature mosquitoes develop. Or after a hurricane in Florida, they can can control the environment by produ- uh, by laying down insecticides or whatever whatever happens. But it's a lot harder with ticks because they only spend a small amount of their life on an animal, and the rest of it's kind of in the leaf litter, hidden. Um, and they don't move around a lot. They don't fly. So it's tricky to have this landscape level control. And so what we're working on from a control perspective is can you create bubbles of safety or safer spaces? Mm -hmm. So bubbles of safer spaces in parks or at schools, uh, instead of thinking we're going to eliminate ticks from the environment, because that is a highly unlikely scenario with the tools that we have available. Um, so my group works um, with host targeted control. So it's we're trying to treat the animals that ticks routinely feed from to kill the ticks that are on those animals. And this happened to be also the reservoirs that we talked about earlier, which are primarily mice and in where we are in, in central Pennsylvania. Um, and so we treat the animals uh, and kill the ticks and that results in a reduction in, in ticks in the area. And so we're working on trying to optimize that kind of control. But there are other control methods as well, like um, acaricide sprays around homes are c- incredibly effective. Um, people don't usually like to hear that. They don't like to hear about compounds being sprayed in the environment. But the the good thing about ticks is that it only really takes two sprays, um, mm. sometimes three. But one spray before uh, the kind of juvenile season of ticks, one spray after, about eight weeks after, and that's it. And you've you've knocked them down for the year, so it does minimize the um, potential negative effects, uh, especially with non-targets like pollinators. Um, that's one of the the kind of the best fail-safe ways to do it. Like you're you're gonna knock them down; they're not coming back that year. Um, but there's other ways too. There's some landscape management. So if you make sure that you're you're in a low low cut grass area away from the woods, um, keeping the um, fallen logs and other woody debris away so animals can't hide in it. So there's some other landscape things that you can do as well. Um, but we are actually quite limited on our tools to control ticks. Now, and when you do the, with the animals, because I was, you know, looking into some of your work. So you, 
you kind of you try to get them somewhere like the mice and the deer that they get like kind of a pyrethroid bath right. almost sort of yeah or- yeah so um we worked with the deer it's called a four poster feeder where the deer feed from a station and there's basically paint rollers where the deer put their head through and it treats their ears which is where the ticks like to hang out hmm. with pyrethroids um that has been somewhat effective but is incredibly time-consuming and expensive to run. And with a lot of concerns about CWD um, with deer, which is a, What's another... What's CWD? Pathogen. It's chronic wasting disease. Okay. Um, and it's spreading, and it can be devastating to deer. Mm. Um, and so the congregation areas are not great. Feeding wildlife in general is not a good idea. <laughs> right. Uh, I was listening to... Yeah, I guess that's a big... Because I wanted to ask, I'm not not hunted or... And have yeah. been out, but it's what because when you, the baiting that's a big yeah. issue. And what exactly is that? Yeah, so we feed them corn or in our trials have fed them corn. And we did a study in Maryland, um, which is USDA. USDA developed this technology, and um, so the study used this technology for better or for worse. But we found that in the two years we had six of these feeders out in three different locations, we put out something like 25 million calories in corn into the environment. And that's got to have some sort of impact on those populations. So there are kind of downstream negative consequences that we're not always thinking about when we develop these control methods. Um, So I'm not a big fan of four posters. So the the host targeted control that, that I use in my lab or that we study is not bait related. Uh, it does provide a resource to the animals in the form of cotton, so they line their their nests with it. So it is a resource, but it's not a food resource. Um, and we treat that cotton is treated with a uh, fabric binding pyrethroid. So and you can buy this for people. You guys have it. Right. <laughs> uh, so exactly. So um, it's the same idea, and it binds to those fibers. Um, and then when the mice take it back, they have their their babies in there, they're in there, any ticks that got on them are killed. Hmm. And so that's kind of the the way we're targeting those mice without feeding them. Right. Now, is that similar? Because I know in that's something people can do with like the tubes. I've exactly. Heard about people, that's exactly like, what you it stuff. is. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So but now, cheap. Yeah, go. If people can do it with, with those tubes. They Well, so they can use those tubes. You can't create the tubes. Um, these are EPA registered trial tubes. So a lot of people think, oh, I'll just make my own. No, you can't because you don't have the products that are labeled to make it. So it's actually legal to do that. Okay. And they have not been tested. So okay. you know, these have been tested to work in this situation, to not to not leach into the environment, right. to rub off at the right amount. Um, so we know that these work, uh, and but they're super easy to get. I mean, you can get them on like Amazon.com. Oh, okay. Like, like, so you can buy, right? You don't have to. Because, yeah, no. I read some, someone saying, no, you take a roll of toilet paper. Yeah, or something. No. And, yeah okay. Yeah, you buy one the of, One of those, you're, we're trying to, like, squash those rumors because, like, right. no, no, no. No, you don't. And because people will try and, like, grab the, the livestock permethrin and soak cotton in it and think that that works. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> it has right. to, like, bind to those fat fibers. There's a specific type, you know. Um, so no, you don't, you can't do it on your own, but they're really easy to get. And it's one of the only tools a, a homeowner has to control ticks around their property that they can do themselves that they don't have to hire somebody to do. Right. So for the sprays, that's something you have to hire a professional to spray. So yeah, you can so always, we, there, yeah. there are some that you can do yourself, okay. um, but there is a certain level of knowledge. You have to know where to spray, when to spray. And so there's a little bit of understanding on, on how that's done. Right. So, okay, good. So, so so that's something you would recommend people an easy way around their yard to also, you know, help. Because I think, yeah, that's the thus. I mean, the more tools people have, the more things they can do. And then maybe, you know, protect yourselves, you know, use your insect shield. But there's just so many tools you need in your, you know, your toolkit to with all the different insects right. and all the different protection. And we and the thing is, I mean, ticks to, I mean... I mean, we don't want to kill all the ticks, do you? I mean, that's the whole thing with insect protection. I mean, what are ticks doing? Are they doing some good in our world? Or someone eating them that they need the ticks? Like, you yeah. know. I mean, so we don't know. Really, we don't know a lot about ticks and tick right. ecology because our our kind of interest in ticks came 
up during like the early 1980s when Lyme disease just kind of showed up and people went straight to how do we kill them? How do we get rid of them? And right. so understanding ticks is very um, minimal. Like we have very minimal understanding of, of what they do and how they do it. Um, and so those are really good questions. You know, like I, from our own work here, we've got mice that we're looking at how mice respond to, to tick bites. And there's some evidence that mice are actually predators of, of ticks. So, you know, they may be eating a lot of the ticks in the environment that may be valuable for them, which then goes on and feeds the foxes or the owls or, or whatever. So there's, there's this, you know, great web that we have to keep in our mind whenever we think about controlling or eliminating or whatever we're doing in the environment that is very important. Yeah, no, I think that's because one thing we have done a lot of work like in the mosquito world and it's like, you don't want mosquitoes gone. Like we need mosquitoes too. There's a lot of things that they do. So, I mean, that's through our whole ecosystem. Right. There's a reason for the most part, usually these different things have sprung up and they, you know, the, you know, all the different, you know, trees and plants and yes. animals and it's, yes. it's the whole, you know, goes all the, goes all the way up. It's the whole thing. Yeah. That's why, like for me, from my, when I teach people, I always talk about personal protection more than environmental protection. Um, but I, I do think it's somewhat related. So using the tick tubes as an example, when you have some control over your environment and you're the one putting down the tick tubes and remembering to replace the tick tubes, you're more likely to recognize when you're in tick habitat. Or I'm I'm guessing you're more likely to recognize right. when you're in tick habitat because you're already thinking this could be where ticks are. And so you're probably more likely to be wearing those repellents and, and protective clothing uh, more so than somebody who's just hiring somebody to come and do it for them. I don't right. know that, but I would assume that some engagement in the process of tick elimination probably has some secondary effects as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, one thing too, so I was listening to some other, you know, podcasts you did, you've done, and, you know, your work was with bears. So you also studied if ticks were, well, but you were doing, well, I guess, in a different, if you had two studies going with bears, but you were actually yeah. tracking, like, counting ticks on bears. And did you know before then that, like, there were a lot of ticks on bears? Or you're like, let's just see, or how did that come about? So... Most of the research that's been done on ticks has focused on mice and focused on deer because everyone likes to blame them for the Lyme disease issues. Right. But then that's really more so because those are the abundant animals that we see and we can get our hands on. Um, I think it's not like 85% of all studies focus on those animals. But but ticks, especially in the Northeast, are, are somewhat what we call generalists where they don't really care what they bite. And there's a lot of other animals in, in the forests. So bears were one that we were studying looking at sarcoptic mange because right. we have a, a mange issue here in Pennsylvania with our black bears. And we thought since we were going to have these animals in a position where we could do that surveillance, we should look at other ectoparasites as well. And, and ticks were one of those. Um, we didn't really know almost, I think, if not all, almost all studies that had looked at ticks on bears had been from hunter harvested animals. So it was one point in time in the fall where, you know, that ticks are different life stages of ticks are only out at certain times of the year. So you're only right. looking at kind of one snapshot. Um, and we were able to look at animals basically all year round, except for when they were denning do it during the study. So we were able to get a really good idea in, in kind of this central Pennsylvania area what was going on um, with those ticks. And it was, it was actually quite fascinating because we'd had this, you know, in the ecology of ticks, we think small ticks go on small animals and larger ticks go on larger animals. And we surely did find large ticks on these bears, but we also found all of the juvenile stages. They were just in between their toes or down farther on their legs than where the, the right. uh, bigger adults were. So it was very, it was a very fascinating um assessment i guess to see right. how they kind of partitioned right yeah and then how ticks are just yeah they're on so many different animals and then right. and yeah and that was i don't know if i heard it right was there 20 there are twenty thousand bears in pennsylvania is that the yeah, number and, i heard that's a lot it seems like a lot but it's a lot and they harvest uh about 25 percent of the bears every year um so it's a lot of bears that that are harvested and a lot of bears that we have in the state, but it's a pretty stable population, a pretty healthy, stable population. So it's kind of, um, it's a great place to do that work. 
Yeah. And when you go, I mean, and do you, when you, because I saw you go, like, do you have to like, do you put them down somehow when you go in to check them? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, so, some, yeah. so we work I'm with. I'm looking at bear closely. talk, but it's interesting. Yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> we work very closely or, or worked very closely with the game commission and their bear biologists and veterinarians um, with their protocols. And they were, they were amazing. So they, they helped us um, kind of tag onto a study and work with the wardens to find the bears that we were looking for. Uh, do a lot of the sedation and monitoring because they have so much experience with the animals themselves. So we could come in and do all the kind of the bug stuff. But um, yeah, we were pretty involved with all the stages of the the trap capture and the the baiting and um, sedation and reversal and all the things, blood blood samples. And so it was a great it was a great time. We got to go to all the dens and see all the cubs, and it was a good it was a fun study. No, oh, that's interesting. Well, I'll allow um, just a couple more questions. I just actually say go back to horses a little bit. What yeah. are there certain things that you recommend for people that maybe like just to say, okay, here's the basics on keeping your horse protected and just things that maybe you see that you feel like people could do a little bit better or they're not doing that could really make the horse's life more comfortable and not have insects being such a, a bother to them or potentially, you know, uh, disease laden. Yeah. So that's a really challenging question because there are so many different types of pests that can affect horses and some horses react differently than others um, to those pests. Some are much more sensitive than others. Actually, we just wrote like a 400 page book that we just published on all the pests and parasites of horses and, oh my and how, to, how to control them. And um, which was, it was really interesting because it was not just North America, but it was other areas of the world. And learning about all the things that go on in other places was um, terrifying. <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh my gosh. Um, but I will say like my my biggest, the biggest piece I think people forget is that they need to know what the pests are that they have a problem with. They assume all flies are the same, even you know, they look awfully similar, but they're not all the same. So some traps are going to work for house flies. Some are going to work for biting stable flies. They're not all going to work for the same species. And I'm not going to work at all for horse and deer flies is a completely different type of control. So really understanding uh, what you have is important. Um, then doing everything you can to prevent those pests from being a problem to start with. So sanitation at the farm, manure management, because uh, once they get a foothold, it's really hard to get rid of them. So being very, very clean and, and doing some of those manure management practices can be super helpful for some of the the pests. Um, one of the things we're, we've been struggling with um, is trying to think of good ways to help protect horses from ticks, really. Um, we did a study last year to kind of get an idea of, of what tick were on horses, when they were on horses here in Pennsylvania, and, and then did a, a kind of a, a separate study looking at um, pyrethroids and if we could use pyrethroids in kind of an automatic applicator like the four poster but for horses because we can feed horses and that's okay basically could you throw them their feed and have them treat themselves every day right. or something along those lines um it turns out at least in the way we were looking at it probably not because the pyrethroid levels that you need to really impact ticks are way too high for horses and would cause some pretty severe skin sensitivity issues mm -hmm. um which has now led us to this treated clothing idea for horses and right. so it's actually something I've been recommending a lot to people. Like I've been using it on my horse. I've been recommending it to um, folks who ask. Um, you know, this technology is out there. It works for people. We don't know if it works for horses. Um, we're right in the middle of a study now <laughs> to try to figure that out. But it can work for so many different types of pests, right? Just, not just ticks. But right. mosquitoes and flies and so many different things. And it takes away that, you know, having to put on fly spray all the time, which doesn't work anyway. And, you know, so like it takes that away and you just kind of have this passive um, repellent or passive treatment on your right. animal. And it seems like such a better solution. So, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what our results say in the way that we're doing it. But, you know, you can buy some products that have. This treatment. Yeah, we have we've it's worked with some yeah. people making to horse sheets and hot fly yep. sheets and things. And, yep, exactly. Um, so there's the insect shield has it. I think no fly zone. Mm -hmm. The different, yeah, it's the different thing. Or so there's there's some other folks too. And then yep. Um, 
I spoke with you guys not too long ago about being able to send in your horse's own stuff and get it treated yeah. with Insect Shield. And it's so it's an amazing opportunity. Like every spring, you just send it in, get it treated, and get it back. And yeah, there you go, and you I know? was just talking actually because I was just doing a presentation with a group in Minnesota, and they asked, and I confirmed yeah. with our guys as long as it's machine washable. Right. Um, you can send it in and I think it's it's like $13 or something. So Right. Like yeah. it's like easy, right? Yeah. So um you know I I I love that idea and you know I think it's just such a wonderful opportunity to attack not attack it's very passive but to handle many different pest is issues at the same time. Right. Yeah, and exactly. It works the same for people and like you said it's with hor it's horses, dogs and we do dog stuff as well because yeah. it's horses dogs awesome. and people <laughs> that, are, yeah. that are affected no yeah. it's, i didn't realize it was just those three you know that that are um those three animals yeah. or mammals that yeah. are and that it, are i mean it's, it's a great thing that you guys have because currently the the sprays that we can use for people are not labeled for horses so we can't use it interesting right so yeah so it, it has to be this way so it's awesome <laughs> that you right. have this yeah. available <laughs> Yeah, no, that's good. No, well, thank you for that. Um, no, it's really that's it's really interesting. Well, just the things that you're working on, and um, we love sharing the the word about you know people just different ways that we can all work to protect our environment and our folks. And I just one I just saw a little news alert that uh, Pennsylvania is is maybe passing a law for schools about making sure everyone that all the at the schools someone knows how to remove a tick. And that the tick must be then saved, which is a huge thing. I know that we come across people. I mean, I never knew you can save the tick and get it tested. That's, that yeah. they might put that into law, which I think is a big. That could be a big thing for you know just people understanding about ticks and how it has to, that you have to know how to remove it. And that saving it is such a such a critical point if you're worried about potential disease. Yeah, I think it just understanding that risk. You know kids being at risk, where they're at risk, where they may be picking up these ticks. And I think that, you know, that coordination with the schools is going to be hugely important. Um, yeah, no, so. it's interesting to see. Yeah, they're, you know, being proactive on that. It's great. So, well, I, well, thank you so much for sharing your your information. Now, this book, is that something that you're, is it on, on sale for to the general public? Is it more of a scientific journal or what's the? No, it, it wasn't. So I, I kind of had this dream to, to write this book, um, and my PhD mentor uh, a couple years ago was like, we should do this. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. But we got a publisher to sign on and we wrote the book. And it's very much a, a practical, uh, horse person friendly uh, book. It has a section, it's broken down to like, you know, this is what this is, what they look like. It's very picture heavy. These are some options for control. It's all science based, but it's all um, very digestible. And there's a sec separate section for kind of the vet part. So if you've got gotcha. veterinarians or people who may not be as familiar with some of these things that they can go through and look. And a whole thing of continuing resources for all these pests. So if you're continuing education. So if you're interested in learning more, there's a lot of resources. Um, yeah, so it's, it was supposed to be a very practical guide. Anybody could pick up, read, and go to the chapter they need and look right. and see what it is and, and handle their pest issues. Excellent. And what's the name of the book? Uh, it is called Pests and Parasites of Horses. Okay. Well, come on, we'll maybe after because we'll get you, but we can put a link to it underneath Yeah, there. sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Excellent. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. And, yeah. Um, and hopefully we can talk again soon and hear what you're up to and other new research that you're you're working on because it sounds like you're really, you're you're in there. You're doing it yourself, like really doing this stuff. It's not, it's just really cool. Doing a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Really, we have a good time. That's awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Erica. Sure.